Continuing on with our Benjamin Franklin story. Here we go. Let me remind you guys, please pay, pay close attention. All right, here we go. Electricity had recently been discovered by European scientists. Uh, nobody knew very much about it, and most people looked at it as magic. Franklin happened to see some experiments in electricity, and he was so thrilled that he sent to London for glass tubes, which were called Leyden jars, friction disks, and other equipment necessary for experimenting. After long practice, he became very skilled at making electricity. Young and old flocked around him to feel the shocks and see the electric sparks. It was no game to Franklin, but he could not help laughing when his visitors jumped into the air, their hair standing on end from an electric shock. Have any of you ever done that, where you have taken maybe a balloon and put it up and your hair stand? Well, I don't have that problem, but let's keep going with the story. For six years, he studied the nature of electricity. He began to wonder if lightning was not caused by electric charges in the clouds. At that time, it was believed that thunderstorms were earthquakes in the sky, but it struck Franklin that electric sparks and lightning looked the same. He, he, had, uh, he had the same strange smell and acted in the same way. If lightning was electricity, he could save houses and churches from destruction by putting metal rods on the roofs. The rods would lead the lightning safely away and carry it into the ground. Wow. But then Franklin talked about lightning rods. Ignorant people protested. God made earthquakes in the sky to show that he was angry and it was not for man to interfere with his will, people would say. Franklin quietly set about to prove that lightning was electricity. On a sultry summer day, uh, when black thunderclouds were gathering overhead, he took his son along as a helper. He walked to a shed in an outlying field and sent a kite into the clouds. The kite was like those he had played with as a child, except that it was made of strong silk and had a thin, pointed rod fastened to its top. The string was of hemp, but the bottom part, which he held inside the shed to keep dry, was silk. Where silk and hemp joined, he had fastened an iron key. Nothing happened until it started to rain and the hemp became wet. Suddenly, he saw the strands of hemp standing up like the hair of a man who had an electric shock. And when Franklin touched the key with his knuckle, he felt an electric shock. He quickly called to his son to hold the Leyden jar up to the sky, and electricity from the clouds poured down the string and charged the jar. Thus Franklin proved to the world that lightning was electricity. But it was a piece of luck that his, this kite experiment didn't kill him. Now lightning rods were put up all over the civilized world. And as lightning flashes across the sky, so Benjamin Franklin's fame flew across the world. English, French, and German scientists showered honors upon the inventor. And his fellow Americans were very proud of him. He was made honorary doctor of laws. Modestly, he continued his simple, useful life as a good citizen, and the people of Pennsylvania needed him badly. They asked him to go to England to persuade the king's ministers that Pennsylvania should be allowed to vote her own taxes. For Pennsylvania could not flourish without taxes on all her land, even that owned by William Penn's descendants in England. Franklin set off with his son as his only companion. His wife and his daughter would not come, for they were afraid of the dangers of the sea. But he loved the sea and was never idle. Even on shipboard, he studied the Gulf Stream, the whales, and the birds. Sometimes when the ship was lying becalmed, he scared his fellow travelers by jumping overboard for a swim around the vessel. One day he noticed that the sea became calm when the cook threw a pail of oily water over the rail. 
Nothing escaped Benjamin Franklin. When he arrived in England, the English thought the best was not too good for the famous Dr. Franklin. They flattered him and they fest they fested him and lords and common people alike listened to his wisdom and his wit. This meant a great deal at a time when the English were likely to treat all Americans as younger brothers with no rights and little sense. Even the king's ministers lent an ear to his, plea, to his pleas. It was not easy to get yes for an answer, but Franklin was patient. Constantly, he presented Pennsylvania's problems and acted as unofficial ambassador for all the colonies. It was more than five years before he sailed home. His townspeople crowded around him to hear of his serious talks and to laugh at his funny adventures abroad. He told how one day he was strolling around a little pond with a group of important men. One of them began to regret that the days of miracles were past. Franklin said he could perform a miracle. He would still the waves of the pond. Turning his back to the group, he went to the water's edge and waved his walking stick like a, wind, like a wand over the rippling waves. Lo and behold, in a moment, the water became as smooth as a mirror. Franklin laughed to himself. He had filled his hollow walking stick with oil and had sprinkled it over the water. Franklin never missed a trick. He had learned this one from the cook on the shipboard. But soon no American felt like laughing any longer. Anger and resentment against the mother country were growing among the colonists. England wanted their money but refused to grant them the full rights of citizens. She put higher and higher taxes upon them. Many Americans grumbled. They said that they had come to the new world to be free and not to be bondsmen of England. They wanted to throw off all ties and be independent. But others said that the English were their brothers and that their quarrel could be mended. If the right Americans could talk to the king, he would see their side of things. Again, Dr. Franklin was asked to go to England. And for 10 long years, Franklin stayed in England. He was sick and unhappy and he was growing old. His faithful wife died in Philadelphia and his son left him to side with the English. Franklin tried to keep pace, but the hotheads on both sides of the Atlantic wanted no peacemaker. The Americans thought he was too slow. The English thought he was too sly. He was called before the Privy Council, where the angry lords abused and humiliated him in public. Benjamin Franklin finally saw that peace was not possible. If he did not want to be thrown into jail, he must sail home at once. When at last he reached home, the fighting had started. The hour had come for the American colonies to join together and throw off the English rule. In Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Franklin and men chosen from all the colonies gathered for the Second Continental Congress. Brilliant young Thomas Jefferson wrote. Let's see what he wrote. He wrote, what do you think he wrote? He wrote the Declaration of Independence. And wise old Benjamin Franklin advised him as the Congress quibbled about the wording, one man saying, put this word in, another saying, take that word out, Franklin told the following story. A hatter who was opening a shop painted a pretty sign with a picture of a hat on it and the words John Thompson Hatter makes and sells hats for ready money. Before he hung his sign, he proudly showed it to his friends. The first one thought he should take out the word hatter, but the sign said makes hats. It was painted out. The second said take out the makes for if people like the hats, they would not care who had made them. Makes was painted out. The third said, why ready money? People who buy expect to pay. It was painted out. The fourth said, why sells? Nobody expects you to give your hats away. The last friend said, why hats? There is a picture of a hat on a sign and at last was left but the name John Thompson and a picture of a hat. At last, on July 4th, 1776, the
the declaration which proclaimed to the world that the 13 American colonies were united as a free and independent country was approved. As he signed his name, Franklin looked around him and said to the other signers, we must indeed all hang together or must assuredly we shall all hang separately. That ends the reading of Benjamin Franklin for today. Guys, I hope you were paying attention. He did some amazing things. I'll talk to you soon.